Hi, welcome to the Parish Art Museum. My name is Corinne Ernie. I'm the Senior Curator of Arts Reach and Special Projects. Artists Choose Artists is a very special project for the parish because it allows us to celebrate the thriving networks of artists living out here on Long Island's East End. This way, the museum serves as a hub to encourage dialogue and conversation as well as mentorship between the artists and their mentors, who are the jurors who select them. So the way it works is that the parish invites seven distinguished artists to serve as jurors and they select two artists each. They conduct studio visits, they have conversations, uh, so they start a dialogue. So there is a real exchange between these artists of different um, generations but also artists who are at different stages of their careers. After that the fun begins for us curators because we do studio visits for every artist and we select the works and make sure it all comes together in a wonderful exhibition. So let's go take a look. Well, my name is Scott Blue Dorn. I'm a multimedia artist, is um, what I would describe myself as, though I mostly draw and paint. Um, and that's taken me to a lot of different places within the world of art. So I kind of came up with a term that encompasses a lot of what I do, and that's maritime cosmology. And what I mean by that is uh, a world that comes out of oceanic uh, traditions, uh, studies, beliefs that include science and art and literature. And I think all these things really influence my work, um, what I take from it. This idea is called the Integrated Ocean Energy Farm. And I think it's a very possible concept where you take, it's actually the idea is I, I would, it's taking a, uh, an oil rig and then repurposing it into a floating uh, turbine, yeah. uh, kelp farm, and then these are actually wave generators which pick up wave power and it's also solar powered. And, and it's kind of the idea of just taking lots of different uh, existing technologies and mm -hmm. combining them into one um, more solid uh, thing that could kind of take advantage of all of them. Drawings such as this, which is uh, an ongoing drawing that's evolving. Um, it, it actually is evolving really kind of spontaneously, so I'm, I'm letting it take me to different places. And it started with a blue whale skeleton. Skeletons have been Particularly whale skeletons have been a, um, a subject of my work in the last couple of years because they are uh, not only such big physical animals, they're also representative of ourselves. So here you're seeing a symbolization, a, sim a symbolic kind of death, obviously, uh, with a skeleton that might be rising above, giving rebirth. It has elements of other natural um, phenomena kind of going on within it. Um, and it's going to be within this landscape that is also constantly in flux and with climate change we know that uh, our terrestrial biomes are changing constantly and, and in ways that we really can't anticipate and even understand. Um, so you are seeing a glacier um, kind of being overtaken by sand dunes but also mountains with palm trees growing through the ice and we, that's kind of my way of saying, we have no idea what our claim, change in climate is really going to hand us. Um, we're in uncharted waters. That's kind of one thing that I'm grasping at is that we have these ideas and we know what our science is, but we don't really know um, in a larger sense what these kind of changes are going to bring about. I've got uh, 55 years of artwork in the shed, under the bed, in the rafters. 
a little bit here, and it turned from being absolutely an admiration of nature to look what's happening. So it turned more dark uh, in a sense because of the pollution, the extinction of the animals and the plants, the fires, the erosion. And so I used the glitter because I liked the idea uh, of making something that was evil look sort of shiny mm. and pretty, like the um, dew on the apple that's poisoned, or the rainbow in the big spill of uh, gasoline, which you've seen probably. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what I had in mind when I would use the, the glitter and the colorful materials. Mm -hmm. And of course the collage materials of dealing with the pollution and detritus that we have. And a lot of these were inspired by places I've been, the Grand Canyon, the Galapagos Islands, seeing places out west, canoeing through the Okefenokee. I just love materials, you know, I've collage, I have oils here, I have acrylics, I have pastels, more collage materials that I save, you know. And as a kid, I would always go to the five and ten buy allowance and buy up all paints and pads and whatever. I'm a very hands-on. My hands are never too clean. <laughs> and I collect a lot of stuff to try out. Always like that element, that nature, I thought it was pristine and beautiful and let's get out there and see it and appreciate it. Save it. Earlier on I was just doing what I saw was the beauty of nature and then it just began to change. Welcome to my studio here in Sag Harbor, everybody. Um, I am obviously a photographer. I've been working in photography for over 30 years, uh, primarily as a documentary photographer, I, um, engaging in sort of long-term projects. Um, the most notable and the most sort of comprehensive would be the work I did in Cuba in the 1990s, um, from 1990 to about 1996 which amounted to about 25,000 pictures. Uh, I spent all told probably a year on the ground in Cuba between 1990 and 1996. Um, I'd go for a month every five months. So, um, so that work was then published um, in a book, Cuba, The Cuba Archive, which came out in uh, the fall of uh, 2017. My initial thought was that um, it was gonna be a little more architecturally driven, I had seen an article in, in National Geographic um, that they were talking about the restoration of Old Havana and that was my initial interest, but once I got there, uh, there was so much more that was compelling and, and ended up some, and looking back, you know, when I went back and re-edited the pictures, the things that were the most sort of compelling and the most sort of emotionally charged for me were, was the portraiture really, because it was, you know, I was looking at these pictures 25 years later and then I'm, you know, looking at this gorgeous, lovely, beautiful child and thinking, wow, they're like, you know. So now the process is basically shooting color negative scanning it, you know, I, I mostly will go in and just because it's still so much fun to go to the dark room and, you know, do contact sheets and, and maybe do some 8x10 work prints, but then basically after I make an edit, I do these big scans and, and then that becomes a, another whole layer of the craft. I mean, I think that there's something about the technical craft that forces you to um, really think about the image and see if it sort of holds up through this whole long process. And 
it, you know, it's kind of great. I mean, I think there's just something about um, finding inspiration wherever you are and not questioning it and not trying to overthink it. President of Magnum for a while. For a while, yeah. Hard work. Yeah. With so many photographers, you know, and everybody has his own thing. But I learned a lot from, from the other ones. Yeah. So I think this is my favorite book because it's kind of strange and funny. Oh. This is a collection he did like uh, three years ago yeah. of his most like ironic and funny pictures. That's my, that's my favorite. Uh, like out of place situations exactly. in music. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like, yeah. He loves to take pictures in museums mm -hmm. all over the world mm -hmm. and, and observing the people interacting with the artworks. <laughs> and Thomas also likes dogs. Mm -hmm. Dogs and Elliot. Dog and Elliot, yes. <laughs> So, you know, in my work, I'm sort of old school. I'm interested in composition, color, texture, <laughs> um, and how to activate a rectangle. And I, I have, I've done installation art, I've done site-specific things throughout my career, but now that I'm back to strictly painting, um, it's back to the basics in a certain sense. I've gone through many periods in my practice where I engage in dissecting geometries. But this is the first time I've ever started dissecting circles. It's been interesting for me. Mm -hmm. And um, it dovetails into the other work. And I, I'm very interested in surface and um, to a certain extent in mystery and I and I think there's an aspect I have earlier paintings of this series but now that I'm into it a little bit further there's more uh, of an integrity of the original circles
And I realized a long time ago that whether I'm, whether I'm working or not, my work is always developing, and I think anyone could say that. It's fascinating. So if, you, if you're in the hospital for a year or, or you know, something happens and you can't really focus for a year or two and you go back to your studio, you've, chances are made the same leaps in your thinking and the way you structure your imagery that you would have if you, I mean, that's because we're artists. My name is Bastian Schmidt and I'm very happy to show you some works of my studio. The next step was how many images or how many solutions could I come up with. And once I was in this mindset, it just like the work kept on giving, which is a very exciting process. So probably for the last four years I have been doing it. So it started with this project, but then it transitioned into different kind of mediums. So what I started doing, I hand painted and pigmented the fabric as a piece, then I cut it up and I kind of like sewed it again in these strips that I kind of composed mm -hmm. with these other ones. And for me again, it's like this is like an endless variation you can create. And you also discover each time you make something, something new. So what happens a lot of times, I think of a particular shape right now, I'm thinking a lot about these kind of L shapes and T shapes. So it's kind of, uh, the, the more you do it, the more you feel kind of like inspired for a new piece. And for me also, a project is never really done in that sense, because while I'm working in this one, I might get an idea to work for the white and white series. So for me, some series are closed and some series are open, but I continue to work over many years on these. So my first project that was actually published as a book uh, 20 years ago was called The Via La Morte and it was how uh, people in Latin America deal with death, death and dying. So it was on one hand like the lyrical aspect of the Day of the Dead and I photographed in uh, Peru, Guatemala, uh, Mexico, um, Cuba, Brazil. It took me like five years to, to complete this project and it was like an inner journey of uh, grief but also positive human emotions. I learned one really important lesson for myself. Uh, a lot of people said, oh, don't do this. It's too grim. People don't want to see it. But I kind of always felt you have to follow your own path. And in a way, it created uh, the beginning of my um, serious career as a photographer, because I had with this project an exhibition at the, a one-person exhibition at the International Center of Photography. I won quite a few awards with it. So in a way, it's like you have to do your own thing and even if people say it's not so. Basically what I do is I pursue color and color theory into different 
philosophical constructs. I think like a lot of art students, I had a kind of crisis and wondered why I was doing anything at all and decided that the thing that really motivated me was my interest in color. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back to the United States, I felt like I had sort of exhausted the scientific approach and I realized that if I was really interested in color, I was going to have to pursue some of the more mystical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And so then I started pursuing the um, trying to, instead of look, looking at it from the outside in, trying to immerse myself in the culture of that color theory so that I could understand it and develop my work out of that. So that's the way I approach my work. working with ideas about the wells and springs of antiquity. So there are a lot of le legends and myths around the springs and wells, these deep sources of water. Mm -hmm. It's also a kind of musing about what is pure and what is true, because that seems to be a very timely topic. <laughs> um, and so each one of these has, is named after a different spring. from this idea that every shape is related to an area of consciousness and so the um, the circle and the curve would represent subcon the subconscious mm -hmm. the square would be the uh, intelligence and conscious mind so this was to unite the two uh, shapes These zinc plates sat probably 50 years and weathered and oxidized and, and all. And, and then I had to pry them all apart. They're monstrous. I didn't know too much about them other than they looked beautiful. They had a quality that was a sort of partnership with, with nature, because nature was creating this oxidation and corrosion. And I looked at it and I said, that it's impossible to restore these to new. So I decided to use them as they were and then put my own two cents worth. So nature did one part and then I did the other part and we worked together. You know, it wasn't a concept to begin with. That's what was interesting. And I was working on them, working on them, and I said, gee, there's all opposites of each other. And I got to think of something that makes some sort of, and the hare and the tortoise, the, the, the fox and the, you know, uh, the frog and the, and the ox. So they all, and that's how they became opposites. I had more fun with this series than any work in my whole life.
It is about the macro, the micro, and it is about nature, organic, mineral, all of it is how I see it. It's, it's the, the relationship of shape and color and how we respond to that. And I, when I work, I work on a number of different pieces at once. Okay. And sometimes I'm working only in watercolors and inks. And then other times, like that over there, is, or other pieces are with um, oil and inks. And so those are the basic elements that I use. I kind of start somewhere on the page and allow the marks themselves to kind of tell me what to do next. I do give myself a couple of parameters sometimes. Sometimes I'll say I want to work where they build up on each other. And then other times I say I want to use, like start with very open shapes and then build into that. Over time, as I've been working, I started out very representationally, but over time I started to really feel that there's a kind of language, you know, um, a non-verbal language that we have, and I wanted to work with that, rather than using things that have a lot of cultural significance or a timely significance. I wanted to move away from all of that and really just go to something more primordial, more the, the language that we have that, that started like when we were single cell organisms and we were trying to survive and the language I feel has built up in our memory, our DNA, kind of like what, what will eat you, what you will eat and you know those shapes and those colors and how, how you survived and evolved as, uh, into what we are today. When you're making art, you're processing what you feel about the world. My relationship to the world is being processed through my work. And once I've kind of resolved certain things, subconsciously or consciously or whatever, I, I need to move on because otherwise I'm just repeating myself. You know, the whole book thing started in part of this reaction to technology. Because I just felt, my feeling is that technology is like it's divorcing us from, you know, the material or the, the tactility of how we used to transfer knowledge through reading on paper. And again, you'll see like reactions to things that, you know, have to do with how we used to learn or how we used to obtain knowledge to today's technology. Mm -hmm. So this is called the, the History of Music. Mm -hmm. And it's basically, it's a History of Music book inside, and then set as a, mm -hmm. it's an iPhone or an old iPhone. And then it's, and then the, the pour overs have to do with, like this is poured over with wax. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of them are wax and, and acrylic combinations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then it goes down the line, and most everything is like a found, you know, found object. Besides the books, it's really a found, found work. Because this is how this is how the process works. Usually, they'll start like this, or similar, like like these type of things, and start looking at, you know, what the verbiage is, what the pieces are, maybe collecting some other ones, maybe like that, maybe trying to manipulate the book, carving into it, you know, or twisting it. 
And like this, this guy was like carved into and inset. And, um, and then after that happens, then I have to kind of let go. I have to think about the coloration and, and, and what happens when I start pouring. And it's a little bit about letting go, mm -hmm. because the beginning of it, the inception is very controlled. Mm -hmm. right, so you start thinking about where everything is placed and what's the meaning behind this and this and this. Mm -hmm. And then it gets to a point where the pour over happens. And when the pour over happens, it just starts to do what it wants to do. And you try to control it and do things you want to do with it. So it usually starts, like these started at the top and then got lifted and started you know, doing this and taking a you know, a knife and running the, running the piece, start scraping off some of the paint where you want to expose some, some of the right. imagery below. fish with all of these all of these paintings and drawings and everything you are underwater with fish that's the viewpoint you are in the water with them things like this which I would find this is an automobile gasket. It goes for some kind of part in the engine. I'm not quite sure. They are different shapes. This is another one that all of these represent everything that's unnatural in the water. That's either industrial debris or chemicals, which we can't see that. Um, so much we can see the results, but we can't see the chemicals. So anything that's hard edge represents the unnatural in the, in the water. Just, it's finding the forms, really. And part of it is like you have a thing like a gasket to work with. But part of it is just like when you're not focusing, but it's what the brush does. I love these forms, like here. Just, you don't know what it's gonna do. It just sort of does it. And that seemed to, it was very interesting to me how it was sort of, real and sort of not and it just and like even this form I have no idea how that happened When you work on something and you're so close to it and you've been developing it for a long time, you think this is real. And of course everyone can see that.
These paintings that were made with a pendulum, you know, initially I didn't come from a painting background, I came from, from a photographic background. And uh, that's what I would, you know, I studied that and semiotics and, and a little bit of film in art school. When I came to New York, I discovered painting about 12 years ago. And so, I, you know, I kind of taught myself whatever. I mean, I, I don't really know. Every time I paint, I feel like I'm just doing something that I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I just approach it. I just try to make something happen. Years ago, I had a, a, a vision of the, uh, you know, the birth of all things, what I call, um, you know, being present at the Godhead. Scientists might call it the Big Bang. And it was in an enormous cosmic dimension. There was a fountain of light. There was a, you know, I mean, it was, it was an incredible, I can't really describe it because it'd be gone beyond description. But coming out of that, I wanted to, to render it. So this is a painting from a, a few years back, maybe three years ago, um, which has elements of, of uh, the landscape paintings. Let me show you. I started looking at Chase just like recently, like a year ago, when I got this space. So the first painting that I made uh, working with Chase was this one. And, uh, and the idea was that I could kind of, I could copy a Chase painting and I could just expand out from it. And I could have the, the believability that you could kind of like enter one dimension of landscape only because I'm using the same palette. No matter how simple it is, that palette contains that quality of light to that moment in time that he, he was out there doing that painting. The thing is, like, you can, like this is kind of moving through time. This is also, you know, moving through time. You compress time into, you know, between 1886 or whenever this painting was made and 2019 and it has a kind of certain believability but in terms of like what painting is about you also have this thing where the paint starts to fall apart and abstraction starts to you know reality is dissolving and and you can experience that at the, at the same time and you know our understanding on a scientific level of like you know what holds all this together or what makes it fall apart doing these videos um, the idea was about using my body to draw you know kind of in the way I use my arm and because it's my history as a dancer and um, and so it's just kind of grown and so then I had this idea of doing them with some in different colors and so this one was in red and so I shoot them by myself um, I create different settings and then I work a lot in Final Cut Pro and cut them and um, start playing with them. In this one I broke up the body and then there's a lot of collage that goes on. Mm.
this one I think was a little bit inspired by the drawing in red um, mm -hmm. uh, video, so that was interesting. Um, and I was, I've often also been doing some little ones. Uh, so sometimes I work on little ones first and mm -hmm. then come up with an idea before I see how it would work larger. Mm -hmm. But of course it changes though. Mm -hmm. um, and I tend to work, so with this one, it's very much about um, layers of rhythms, layers of drawing, you know, layers of color, um, the rhythm of the colors. And um, this one was kind of coming along, and then suddenly, when I worked in this sort of green color, the whole thing came. <laughs> it's always so interesting that moment when it's sort of like, oh, now it's finally clicking. So I started as a dancer many, and I. I when I was 16, I joined the dance company, and mm -hmm. so I had a whole career in that world. And then um, in my 20s, I started to paint and got did all of that, and actually very much left, you know, because I was trying to have a new identity. Mm -hmm. And then, but then I, f I found that my, um, you know, so much of my work is inspired by movement and rhythm and music and all those things. And some of the work that I've done has been very shape oriented, so I was trying to find new shapes. That's kind of how I started um, dancing again and filming myself. And then in the course of it, kind of just got like fascinated with this. Lilies, yes. I have an obsession with the calla lily. I walked into a room once uh, with uh, hundreds of wild calla lilies on tables, and it, it just and people were cooking in the next room, and the sensory, and I could hear them speaking as they were cooking, and the it was a complete sensory experience. Um, and so I've, um, when I was I would say in my twenties and early thirties. If I had trouble with a painting, I would just go back to that moment and be surrounded and, and work from that. So that is, that's a good deal of what is going on. But then, of course, I'm an abstract painter, so it can go anywhere. It's just a dialogue. I realized that um, at that moment, and perhaps always, the marks that one makes within these works are like love notes of, of caring. You know, I think when one tries to be very honest with the work and, you know, that, that marks go in because the marks need to be there having to do with what the entity is becoming. Uh, you know, that's the dialogue. that. It tells me what it needs, and then I understand from that what it is. And so I just wrote all over it love notes to those I have known and those I have not known. Um, and I, I think that that's an important element. Uh, I think uh, for artists, art is communication, and uh, that is why it's so good for someone to see it because the, the circle is then complete. Mm -hmm. um, I think many artists have spoken about that and I find it to be very, very true. And I suppose that, that sense of equilibrium, that sense of, um, gee, is, is this really gonna hold? I think mm -hmm. that's the psychological sense that I like, similar in the paintings, that how is something built and what is, 
you know, I, I think uh, people tend to see uh, different things mm -hmm. in the uh, images. And uh, I like that, that one finds these things. But again, the way that one's mind works in connecting the lines and dots is what's fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. um, because again, it's, it, it's is, is this really this? You know, which, which I, I think references how we question life, yeah. you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes we can't quite believe that it's what we're seeing, we're really seeing.